Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> On a fantastic Monday evening. Welcome to Night Tracks Radio. And I'm, of course, your humble host, the teddy bear, Mr. Rated Extraordinary. And tonight's artist spotlight, gifted comedian, actor. He does it all. The extremely talented Mr. Mark Christopher Lawrence. Brother, how have you been doing? And welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, been doing OK. You know, just grinding. You know what? One of the first things I wanted to talk to you about this new miniseries, Fragment Oblivion. And I find it rather apropos the things that we are experiencing right now mm -hmm. in this country food shortages, looting. And I'm like reading this and going over this. I said, this is. This is scary. This is this is really scary. And your character, of course, is Roderick Cody. Can you give the fans out there a little bit more insight about the movie? Well, you know, basically, um, this this group of individuals who are connected by this event that happens prior to the starting of it's actually a, a, a mini series, six episodes, and um, uh, they're sort of shoved together because of the event and they're trying to figure out how millions of people disappeared and why they were left behind it almost sounds like the rapture a little bit well, well I, I didn't say those words but yeah, it, it, remi <laughs> it, remi it reminds me a lot of it as far as the rapture mm -hmm. concerned, one of the things that I've always found so impressive about you is that you've been able to be successful, especially on the comedy circuit, without using any profanity. And that's a, that is a rarity. And I also know as far as being devout in your beliefs and standing on your mm -hmm. beliefs have greatly helped you as far as the topsy-turvy business that we call show business how have you been made how have you been able to kind of somewhat maintain an even balance and not lose who you are in the industry well i mean part of it is is surrounding yourself with people that are grounded and that are not in the industry and uh people that just want to see you succeed no matter what you do like my my uh, closest group of friends are not in the industry um there's some military there's educators there's uh, engineers and um, you know we're there for each other when things happen and um, there to help keep each other accountable and and you know that's that's it you, you know keeping a, a tight circle of friends that that uh, you know you love and they love you and and want to see you succeed you know it's amazing because you had a fantastic career and you have been doing this a long time but i gotta ask you what gives you greater satisfaction doing comedy or actually doing the movies or doing television um comedy and theater are my favorites because you affect people in real time you know it's like the comedy people are either are, are laughing right now you know in, in, in theater people are either laughing or crying or whatever right now you know, with TV and film, you got to wait for the editor, hope the editor does you a good turn, and, and uh, you have no control of that. And, and oftentimes, you know, 90% of the time, 95% of the time, you don't know how it affects people unless somebody jumps into your DM and say, hey, that movie helped me through a tough time or whatever. Without question, without question. I know you get asked this a lot. Fear of a black hat. Yeah. Cult classic. <laughs> a cult classic, man. I mean, you and Rusty. <laughs> man, you guys put something really magical together. And I wanted to ask you, during that particular time, as far as developing the movie and also coming up with those particular characters, did you ever think it would have that kind of longevity and attract so many people after all this time. People love this movie, man. You know, we, Rusty um, shot a short called The Trial of NWH. Okay. Years prior to actually making the movie. 
And uh, so he brought me there. And remember the Jam Boys manager, uh, the brother that got killed? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was it was me, Rusty, and him. It was Tim Tim uh, Hutchinson. Right. Uh, so I was, after we shot it, Rusty was actually using that to shop his writing. And then uh, I was in, con- in Canada doing comedy, and, and he called me up and says, hey, where are you? So I'm in Canada. He says, so ITC Entertainment Group wants to produce the movie Fear of a Black Hat, so we need to do some auditions with people because uh, they want they want somebody different for the role of Taste to Taste. So we did a bunch of auditions when I came back home, and, uh, and we auditioned Glenn Plummer, and Glenn was intense. <laughs> <laughs> Glenn was scared us. <laughs> and then Larry B. Scott came in. Oh, he and, killed it. And he, he, had, killed. he had that that that, <laughs> that edginess and that funniness at work. And and our chemistry was great together. In fact, uh, in 2019, we shot um, a sizzle reel for uh, sort of a show that, that was kind of a where are they now kind of thing. Right. Uh, you know, they were shopping it, but, you know, it didn't get any traction. It's like people said, well, maybe it's too old. But, but, then, but then, you know, here comes Night Court. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, chemistry. You know, on set when we shot the sizzle reel is still there. So, we, so, so if somebody's out there want, want to produce this thing and try to help get it out there, you know, hit up Rusty and let's let's go. <laughs> we need to make we need to make that happen. You know, I look back on it; it's amazing, man. We're both around basically the same age. When you started, mm-hmm. there were no streaming apps, and now you see no streaming apps like Tubi, and I look on every time I look around, you see a lot of black movies, a yeah. lot. And I know you have a great fondness, and a lot of people may know, Mark is an extremely gifted producer. Producing a movie and being in charge of so many different egos <laughs> and mood swings. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. I, I, I think, I think um, you know, the, the times that I've produced, it's just been really easy. Okay. And, and um, you know, things just fall into place, and 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 that that's the way it works when you when you work with people that that you like and you like their talent and that kind of stuff. So it's so it's it's easy to to, to make something happen when when everybody is on the same page. Do you think it's somewhat more of a camaraderie when you when you're doing an independent movie? instead of doing a big budget movie where everybody has, I has the old saying, people leave their egos at the door and people have one common goal to really make a good movie. You know, I, I think this, this, this industry is so fickle, you know, that um, like, like I worked on Terminator 2, which was what, $210 million budget. Yeah. And, and that was fantastic. I mean, it was really great working with them. And then just this last year, uh, I worked on a lower budget film for Damascus Road, and it'll be out in, in November. It's called um, Bringing Back Christmas. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a faith based project, and, and from the top to the bottom, everybody was so nice. And it was, it was, um, I never, I, I think in, in all the years that, that I've been in the industry, it was the best really yeah i'm really surprised to hear you say that because i mean you have worked on a lot of movies and to hear you say something like that that's but you know what that's refreshing like you said when you when you're dealing with people who actually care and they go out of their way to perfect their craft is definitely a major major influence because everyone has one common goal, man. Right. Oh, before I go any further, man, I gotta wish you an early happy birthday, man. It's right. Thank you. <laughs> I tell you, these years, <laughs> man. Hey, I remember when we both had hair, so there's no shit. <laughs> uh, somebody, somebody sent me a picture from college yesterday, uh-huh. and I, I looked like I'm twelve. Oh. <laughs> I was like, I, all I said was, "Where, where did the years go?" <laughs> I, you know, I ask myself that all the time is, you know, we can accumulate so many things in life, but one thing we can't accumulate or stop 
is time. No, no, we cannot. We can't. We can't stop time. Is there any particular movie that you were offered to do, and you turned down, and it went on to be a very successful movie? Mm, uh, no, I, I don't. I don't think I've turned down any movies. I turned down an audition for Soul Plane. Really? Yeah. Um, and and VL actually ended up doing the role. And okay. And uh, you know they said well it was it, it was going to be scale and. And I just, I just didn't want to do it. I was like, eh, I read it and I was like, eh, I don't think I want to be seen in this light. And then, <laughs> and then uh, you know, Dale was the, he was the, uh, the bathroom attendant on the plane. Oh man, that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I took a pass and, and then, and then they, and then they hired DL and I was like, you know, and, and I know DL didn't work for scale. So it was right. like, <laughs> so I was like, I, I was glad I passed. When can we expect you? I've seen everyone have a Netflix special. When are you going? Come on now, I'm speaking to everyone out there. When are you going to get a Netflix special, man? Because for people that haven't had an opportunity to see Mark on stage, it's incredible. So I'm, I mean, have you ever? Have they ever approached you about doing no, a Netflix special? No, really? I, I did. I did a dry bar special that has millions of hits. One of the clips from Dry Bar has 19.1 million views on Facebook alone. Wow. And uh, so now I'm writing a new hour. And, uh, you know, I, I think when, once I'm done, may, maybe I'll try to shop it to, to Netflix and, and see. I, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Some, something's very wrong. I mean, you know me. I. I love everybody, but I must say the the when I the last Netflix uh, stand up that I seen was with Monique, and I'm just it just just for me from a personal standpoint, it was horrific. I mm. mean, it was it was horrific. I mean, I think it's very easy to get on stage and go into a a profit top and do something, but it takes a genius with someone that has this here that can really capture an audience mm. and bring them in. And you had that ability to do so. I must say, man, when you did the movie with uh, Will Smith, I, that one scene, man, I was, man, I was so pissed, man. I was, I said, man, he just left him hanging in the, <laughs> in the pursuit. You, oh, man, you left him hanging in the way like that was a cold, that was hey. a cold blooded part. What was it like working with Will? It was great working with Will. Will. Will was was a great guy to work with. Um, the day that I went to set, you know, I worked with some big, big names. Right. And Will is one of them. And I went to set, and, and usually, like the stars get their makeup done in their trailer, and I go to go to the makeup trailer, and, and Will was in there getting his makeup done. It's just me and him and his makeup artist, and the one that's working on me. He gets up out of the chair, comes, gives me a hug, welcomes me to set. And um, just you know, really a good dude. And, and when I when I got on set, he came. He was like, you know, hey, you need something to drink or something? I said, yeah, maybe that water. And he went and got it himself. He didn't send somebody. He went and got it. And 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 that's the kind of guy he is. And you know, it's unfortunate that that you know the slap and all that. And but you know, I mean, you don't know what people are going through. And. Yeah. That's and, one thing about it. When I remember, I've heard you said num numerous times, just because you you're in the entertainment industry and you're here to entertain people, you never know what's going on with a person's life. Yeah, well, I tell people all the time. It's like it's like you know, I'm I'm always I always try to be gracious and and kind to people. Um, but I grew up in Compton. It, it, it's in there. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> 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 don't, go, don't go poking the bear. <laughs> it's like that great American poet once said, Tupac Shakur, don't put these, I'm not a killer, but don't push me. Don't push me. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what was that like growing up in Compton? I'm from South Central Los Angeles. So what was it like? We grew up, like I said, we're the same, basically the same age. What was it like for you growing up so, in that so era? We grew up in, in the house that my mom lives in today. She'll be 84 years old this year. Wow, that's a blessing. Uh, uh, we moved there in 1969. We were the second black family on our street. 
it was all white. Yeah. By 74, all the white people that moved out, you know, uh, I, I believe there was a term, white flight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, most of them moved to Simi Valley and, and, you know, the surrounding areas. And, and Redondo uh, Beach, Redondo Lake, Beach. Yeah, Lake <laughs> Oh, yeah. Hard and, uh, you know, and then the Robinsons moved in. <laughs> <laughs> They seven brothers of gangbangers. <laughs> I had never even heard of a gang until the Robinsons moved in. <laughs> oh my you know, god! And, and, and so, so, and I tell people um, I liken it to a frog in a pot of cold water, and you turn the fire on slowly, heat it up. The frog just adapts to the environment and will stay there until he's boiled alive. Right, and so. Growing up there and the change that happened, you know, uh, it, it, it was just, you know, I adapted to the environment. It wasn't as if, you know, all of a sudden I was scared to be there. You know what I mean? Because because it was it was just, you know, it changed while we were growing up. Right. And now it's changing again. Now it's 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 mostly Latino. But the last time I visited my mom, I saw like this white dude just walk around. Yeah. I was like, oh. And he walked into a house with some keys. I was like, oh, he lives here. <laughs> so so it's changing. It's starting to gentrify. Yeah, um, without without question. It's interesting that you said that because I noticed a lot of the African American families, they left Compton and started moving up to Palmdale. Marino Valley. Yeah, Marino Valley. Yes, mm -hmm. San Bernardino County. Yeah. Yeah, they relocated. I remember when I was growing up at one time, because I lived right down the street from Bethune Junior High School. Mm -hmm. And Bethune was all Anglo-Saxon. So was Fremont, all that area. At one time, yeah. I remember there were two uh, two Anglo-Saxon families that actually lived on our street on 67th and Broadway. Mm -hmm. And all, nice people. They were there for about maybe two more years, and then they, <clears throat> they left. Yeah, yeah. They, were, they, were, they were gone. Yeah, our next-door neighbors were very nice, and they were the only ones that were very nice. There, there, there's a there's a, a series on, I believe it's I believe it's Netflix. It might be Amazon. Okay. Uh, called them. Oh yeah. So <laughs> I watched that one night, and it brought back all these memories. You know, our dog getting poisoned. And, yeah. You know, people snatching their kids up when I come out to play. They snatch them up, take them in the house, and. Um, you know, just brought a, a flood of memories. And, you know, for, for me, I guess I had suppressed all that. And, and when I when I watched that series, I was like, oh, wow, yeah, I remember this happened and that happened. And, you know. It's, it's rough, but you stayed focused. And you were able to get out and not only go out, get out, you were able to go to the University of Southern California. Well, it, 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 because of a teacher that, that I had in the 10th grade, Mrs. Schilling, my English teacher, um, you know, really, really uh, changed the trajectory of of where I was headed because I didn't know what I was doing. I was hanging out with the wrong people. And she gave me something else to do. She got me involved in speech and debate. She put me in my first play. She introduced me to a guy, uh, Perry Brents, who uh, kind of helped me uh, with my comedy. And, and so first time I was on stage as a comedian, I was in the 11th grade and went, went to the comedy store, you know, with my buddy Lennon and, and we, we went up as a team. And then Perry put me on one of his shows, you know, uh, by myself. And, and you know, Mrs. Schilling, I always say, you know, I do what I do today directly because of her influence in my life. So if there's educators out there, there's teachers out there, um, no, no matter how hard it gets, no matter no matter how much you, you had to deep in, reach into your pocket and 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 buy supplies and help kids, you know, uh, if you reach one, you know, you've done a great thing. You know, I, I, every milestone in my career, I would call Mrs. Schilling and let her know what what has happened now because of your influence, and she would cry every single time. <laughs> and and, and um, about uh, what was it? 2019 or 2018, we buried her. And, wow. And uh, a bunch of her past students were there. You know, and Terry, who got me involved in time, we were there. And, and, he, and it just shows you the, the, the love that she had for her job. And some of these teachers are just going through, going through the motions. 
You know, my, my algebra teacher, I started hating math because of my algebra teacher. You know, wow. if, you, if you missed a day, you've missed a whole chapter and he didn't care. He wouldn't try to help you catch up. You know, sometimes because I, I was at a speech center, I would miss a Friday, come back mm -hmm. totally lost and he didn't care. And um, if, if, if you are charged with shaping young people's lives, then you should be fully invested and enjoy it and know that that you will change somebody's trajectory of their life just by you loving on them and showing them that there's something better than being in, in, in the hood and being a gangbanger or a drug dealer or all that. I'm glad that you brought that up because I wanted to ask you, do you think now it's harder for educators, it's harder for teachers now to try to get through to these students now? Because when you and I were growing up, yes, we experienced gang violence. We've always had gang mm -hmm. violence in South Central Compton, you name it. There's been mm -hmm. gangs there. But now we're different with a whole different bowl of soup now. I mean, you're seeing... Yeah looting and shooting kids are being victimized in school mm -hmm. and the teachers are grossly underpaid and the teachers that you do have out there that truly want to make an impact on these students right. is very challenging for them i mean have you given any thought as far as as far as what would be the best way to try to i guess navigate to try to reach a lot of these kids well i think i think part of it is um, one, if you go into education, you went into it because you loved it. Right. And you got to remember that that's, that's why you're there because you loved it and you wanted to help somebody. And then it becomes, uh, the school district and the school itself and trying to help keep kids safe on school, making school a safe place to be. Um, uh, and, and then you, you know, we got to get the parents involved somehow. It's like, it's like my mother would come up to the school once and then I was good for right. a, couple, a couple of years. <laughs> my mother got, if my mother got a call, you know, I, I was good for a couple of years. <laughs> oh, that that sounds familiar. That I, sound think, I think our government has systematically taken the powers of parenting out of the hands of parents, and parents are sending problems to school. Yeah, you know things that that that, that need to be dealt with in the home, and 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 you know we need to start there. We, you know, there's no discipline, and kids have have no consequences to their actions is what, is, is what we're seeing now. Yeah. And um, somebody told me the other day that a that, that, uh, kid, she's an educator, I was doing comedy, said a kid spit on the teacher next door to her. Yeah. And, and I was like, you know, that was unheard of when I was a kid. Was like nobody was was messing with a teacher in that kind of way, yeah. And 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 I think we you know we as as parents have got to be better in being sure that our that our kids are you know responsible citizens. But the key element that I want to touch on that you just said, parents, you don't see any parents today like your mother mm -hmm. or my mother. Mm -hmm. You have parents today that are out there twerking, going to the clubs, yep. lack of discipline, mm -hmm. lack of character, lack what? of integrity, mm -hmm. and they're, they're implementing this on the kids. Yeah. And now the kids are taking that same attitude and mentality they're bringing to the school. Yep. Well, if a mother is going to conduct herself in this way, using going through profanity-laced tirades and using this type of language towards me, it's acceptable behavior to actually mm -hmm. sit up here and do the same thing to a teacher, the lack of respect. Right. I you spent, know, I spent three years working with the little school in San Diego down in San Ysidro. It's the last school, elementary school before the border. And okay. the principal, um, she and I had a conversation and she said, you know, will you come and talk to our, 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 our teachers at, uh, you know, orientation? And I said, I'll do you one better. I said, I'll bring somebody who actually does that. And um, I said, and then I'll come and talk to your kids. And then I'll bring you speakers from, from different walks of life to talk to your kids. And for three years, I did that. And um, uh, this, this one little girl was winning an award from the school district. And uh, the principal called me and said, hey, can, can you come to this luncheon where this little girl is going to get this award? Because she is so proud that that she did this because of something that you said in one of the one of the sessions. I said, sure. So I came and then 
the teacher was sitting together and the little girl was there and her mom was there. And her mom was a young mother, you know, probably early, early 20s. Okay. Toward the end of the afternoon, you know, we were saying goodbyes and standing there taking pictures and and some song came on and her mother starts twerking right there. And, and I could see in the little girl's face how embarrassed she was. Yeah. And I think, you know, parents have to be mindful of, of what they are showing their kids. Yeah. You know, you know it, 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 I felt so bad in that moment. And, um, yeah, just be mindful. Kids are like sponges. They soak it up. You know, yeah. So be mindful of what we're feeding them. I think a lot of our parents, the <clears throat> excuse me, so-called parents today have been, become social media caretakers. Mm. Yeah. They're heavily influenced by social media where you have mothers who want to be celebrities. Yeah. The kids spend an inordinate amount of time on social media. Yeah. Lack of communication, be a, being able to speak to one another. You know, you get on Twitter and you say things. It's like, wow, there's no more communication anymore. I remember you actually had to speak to someone. Right and now, it's, it doesn't it doesn't exist anymore. I remember when I was in junior high school. I remember a couple of kids that I didn't even know. They would literally come up to me. Oh, your mom is here. She's at the school. Mm -hmm. My mother was in part of, she was part of the PTA. She was involved in every aspect of me growing up as far as educational wise, because my father had passed away when I was, what, 11 years old. So she mm -hmm. took on both men and she was there. She made sure we don't see that now. No, no. My, my god sister, uh, <clears throat> her son was, was acting up in school, in high school. And she worked at the airport and would get off at like six in the morning. So she would go home, take a shower, and then go to his school and sit in class. Wow. With him. And change change the way he acted at school. <laughs> <laughs> my mother had to come to the school <laughs> and sit in my class. I'd be standing up in that class. <laughs> oh my goodness. You but you know what? Man, but that's called parenting. That's called parenting. That's called taking an active involvement to make sure say, hey, look, the teacher's responsibility is to invest in the student and make sure they get the best education they possibly can. But we as parents are responsible to groom our children to be adults, mm -hmm. self-sufficient adults. And we're not seeing a whole lot of that right, right. now. Right. Hey, for all the people that are tuning in late, shame on you. But the teddy bear does forgive you. We're actually being joined by the fantastic comedian, of course, actor extraordinaire, Mr. Mark Christopher Lawrence. And to get all the pertinent information to find out his upcoming dates as far as performing live and also upcoming movies, miniseries, be sure to stop by his official website. That's at www.markchristopherlawrence.com. Dot com. Speaking of that, what's on the docket? When are you going to be performing live? What is your next live comedy event? Ooh, um, uh, L L Laguna Beach, well, okay. Anaheim, April 25th at Chance okay. Theater. And then I'll be at uh, Laguna Theater. Um, and these are the shows that I'm producing and, and hosting. Uh, Laguna Theater, May 2nd. Laguna, L the Laguna Playhouse. Okay. It's a 400 seat, 404 seat theater. Um, uh, Chance Theater is much smaller, but but you know, it, it's fun. It's a fun room to do. It's just that energy. Um, and then I'm I'm in Miami uh, for the Human Growth Foundation Walk for Kids Growth, and I'll be there the 29th of April. It's a free event in a park in in Miami. You can go on the Human Growth Foundation website. Okay. Okay. And, and find out all the info for that uh, humangrowthfoundation.org and um, and then I'll be doing one of those in in LA uh, the same type of event walk for kids growth and I don't know what the date is for that one but what I'll do is I'll I'll, I'll post it on my website so people can can get it but but if you go to human growth foundation you'll see all the dates for it okay right. All right, again, family, be sure to go to the official website. That's at www 
MarkChristopherLawrence.com. You did a Christmas movie where you played one of the spirits, and I laughed myself. Uh, <laughs> Christmas present. Yes. <laughs> she, she says, present? No, Brother, present. <laughs> Man, you know, the Lifetime channel has a lot of wonderful content, oh, yeah. man. A lot of wonderful content. Can you see yourself somewhere in the future actually doing some more work on Lifetime? Yeah, I was working a lot with um, uh, my friend Gerald Webb. Uh, uh, he, he and his his business partner uh, did a lot of stuff for Lifetime. So, if, you know, if they start doing more of that stuff, I'm sure I'm, I'll, I'll be in. Gerald's... Um, and I produced a thing called Stacks. Um, okay. Dollar sign T A C K dollar sign. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, we shot it right before LA closed down for the pandemic. It was like wow. the night before we started shooting at seven p.m. We finished at three in the morning and noon the next day. LA quarantine. And um, I was nominated for an Emmy Award for acting in that one. Oh, that's and beautiful, it, man. It, it, it's it's really, really good. Uh, if you go to my website, it'll pop up. You, okay. You'll be the first thing you see on my website. And so go go and watch Stacks. It's it's a good time. Do you ever miss doing Chuck? Man. <laughs> <laughs> that was you a know, great series, man. It was a great series. I hate that that, you know, NBC didn't give it the love it deserved because every year they would wait to see if they picked up any of their stuff because they didn't really want us there. They didn't wow. want to pay the, the, the uh, licensing fee. And so we would lose writers every season. The writer that wrote, I think, the best stuff for me was Allie, Allie, Allie Adler. And she, um, when she left the show, I was bummed. You know, because by then it became the era where Big Mike just ate sandwiches. <laughs> and and it, it, it got a little boring but um but the show and the cast i mean the cast and the crew were fantastic to work with you know zach levi was was is probably one of the the unhung unsung heroes of of the industry i mean he's he's really a gracious gracious guy the giver to a fault you know um th there were events where i didn't i didn't have a publicist and where his publicist would take care of me at events. And, you know, I mean, he, he's really a great dude. You know, he, I'm so happy for the success that he's having, you know, with the movie stuff right now with Shazam and, and Sean <laughs> Story and, you know, and, and, and he's, he's, he's leading the charge trying to get a, a Chuck movie. So I hope that happens. Man, I hope, man, I loved that show. It was so entertaining and it was so funny. But as you just said, it's, when you do when you take a when you take away the essence as far as the creative part of writing mm -hmm. from the show, the show deteriorates. And we've seen it with a lot of different successful shows. Yeah. You, they move it to a different time, or you see writers are leaving the show yeah. and it's just not it doesn't have the same kind of impact. And speaking of impact, for a young up and coming actor, and they approach you. And they say, what does it, they ask you, what would it take for me to be not just a successful actor, but just to be a working actor? What would be some of the tidbits or knowledge that you would give to them to embark I, I would, on that journey? I would tell them um, consistency. You know, uh, be consistent, be a pro. You know, treat, treat people with respect. Um, train, train, train. I couldn't, I couldn't emphasize that much any further. I still take improv. You know, it helps not only my stand up, it helps my acting. You know, the more training you get, the better you are. Do some theater. Theater really helps you grow your craft. Right. Theater will, will expose your weak spots. So, so do some theater. Um, I try to do a play every year. Although I haven't done one since 2012, but you know that year I won San Diego Critics Circle Actor of the Year. And um, but but theater really helps you because because 
the, the only thing that you can control and the only thing that you know for sure is how your day went. And you yeah. get to the theater, you got to put your day aside, no matter how terrible it was, and do this job that uh, is consistent. I mean, you know, set a performance, and the actor that you're working with in this scene may uh, have a horrific day. He gives you a line a little bit differently than he did last night. You still have to make that line, your response, work in a way that it makes sense for the play. You don't know what the audience went through. You don't know what their day was. So they may be laughing or crying in different spots. So you have to be aware. And, and all of that comes with training. It's like the, the more training you can get, the better you're going to be. Stay in, a, in, a, in an acting. Stay in Without question, I've heard Denzel, from Denzel to Samuel Jackson to Lawrence Fishburne, they said the greatest euphoria that they actually, euphoria that they get is when they do theater. Yeah. Because they get an opportunity not only to perfect their acting, but it's something very special with that interaction. Yeah. Well, well and, and if something and something didn't work tonight, you can fix it tomorrow night. Tomorrow, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and that's that's the that's the beauty of live theater and live performances. It's like, okay, that didn't quite go as expected tonight. Let me see how I can tweak it and make it work better tomorrow. And and that's where you really learn to be an actor. Without question. Brother, first and foremost, I want to, it's been a long time coming and I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedule and joining us this evening. Much continued success. I still have my fear, the fear of a black hat on VHS. I'm really dating myself, but that's all right. I <laughs> you, know, you know, I may, I may, I may have a DVD for you. Oh man, I'll, that man! I'll, I'll take my story take, and see and see and see if there's see if there's one in there. If, if there is, I'll get it to you. Oh man, I appreciate it. Lo hey, gotta have an autograph, man. I need next. <laughs> sure. I need that. I need that signature. And again, family, be sure to stop by his official website. That's at www.markchristopherlawrence.com. My brother, much continued success. Many blessings to you, man. Do what you got to do. And thank you for making us laugh, man, in a very positive manner. Thank you oh, so much. Thank you, brother. Thank you for having me on. And 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 if your listeners are listening and uh, if they could just follow me on Instagram, that would be fantastic. That's at Instagram.com forward slash Mark Christopher Lawrence. So it is written. So it shall be done. Yes, Lord. Okay. <laughs> All right. God bless, brother. Thank you, brother. All right. I appreciate you. Save here, the super talented Mark Christopher Lawrence here on Night Tracks Radio. Again, follow him and support him on Instagram. Of course, Instagram, markchristopherlawrence.com, Facebook, same handle, and also the official website at markchristopherlawrence.com. You know, of course, with the three W's ahead of it. It's been a fantastic evening. I want to thank everyone for tuning in and allowing the teddy bear to help you tune out all the negativity. It's definitely been a <laughs> refreshing evening. Without you, there's no me. But as in always, keep it soulful here on Night Tracks Radio. Lord have mercy.